Hey, and welcome to futurethinkers.org, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvia Ivanova. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, popular episodes, and to join our community, go to futurethinkers.org slash start. All right, guys, welcome to this episode. We're still on the Archetype series. We're going to be talking about the magician today. Um, this one I'm particularly excited to talk about because I feel I occupy this archetype quite a lot. Um, it's about an understanding and um, willingness to teach and use hidden secret knowledge, which is basically uh, your willingness to um, put in the effort that is required to learn deep knowledge. Yeah. And then also the effort of being a mentor and teaching this knowledge to other people. Yeah, and so that might sound pretty esoteric, deep hidden knowledge, but what that really means is that it's anything that isn't immediately available through common sense. It's any sort of skill, whether it's in technology or any kind of specialized skill, you know, if you're becoming a lawyer or uh, an engineer, or if you're studying philosophy, or it basically any kind of knowledge that isn't immediately available just from living your everyday life. Mm -hmm. Or it could be something esoteric, it could be meditation, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. So uh, before we get into it, um, I just want to let you know that you can go to the first two episodes by going in the description of this video. And then the next one we'll also place in the description as well once it's out. Yeah. And so, the yeah. next one will be the king yeah. archetype. Yeah, that one's going to be interesting too. Okay. So let's start. How would you describe the magician in his fullness? So the magician in his fullness has a, a very deep curiosity for everything in life. He wants to uncover things that are not immediately obvious. He wants to understand how things work and then apply that to create something. So the magician is the creative force, really. Um, and he is kind of in the driver's seat in, in many ways. So we, when we talked about the warrior archetype, he's the one who goes out there and executes uh, the magician is the one who is driving the warrior in this case. Yeah, giving the orders. Yes. The thinker. Yeah, the man behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a strange thing that some people claim that the magician archetype is really needed in this day and age. And yet we're in the technolo technological internet age. And it seems like everything is like the playground for the magician. But there's a difference in the the final part of the definition of the magician, which is the willingness to share information. So to become a mentor and to give these this like secret knowledge to other people. Because everything's so competitive in our kind of job landscape, um, you know, even the the people who would be mentors are now competing with each other and competing with their would-be students. So there's a definitely a less of a willingness to be a mentor. However, there's also this expectation of people that information is always freely available anywhere you look. And that as soon as information is kind of labeled as secret, it's like, well, what are you up to? It's, people get really suspicious. Yeah. Or, and at the same time, there's a proliferation of people who are charging for information and uh, saying that it's like, oh, this, the top 10 secrets of blah, 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 you know. Yeah, pick up artists. Uh, yeah, pick up artists or, or marketing gurus or... Uh, whatever. But um, there's a point to be made that in, in human history, when people would go after some sort of secret knowledge, when they, for example, studied consciousness very deeply, there's a reason why things wouldn't be revealed to everyone immediately. Because there are certain steps that people have to take, they have to learn things in a certain order, because certain kinds of information can be misused or abused if they are put in the wrong hands, which is why, you know, in the book, The Secret, they talked about how this, uh, you know, these techniques for kind of manifesting the life of your dreams were, were hidden in history, in the history before. Um, but I think there's a very good reason for that, because, yeah, in the wrong hands, this kind of information can be harmful. There's another element to it, though, where the information can be so complex and so difficult to learn that just diving into the deep end, it's like if you told someone, go make me an app um, and they didn't know how to program, it's like, well, where do I even begin to do something like that? I need to know design. I need to understand the application. I mean, I won't even list it. It goes on and on and on what people have to learn. 
So um, that's where kind of this directed learning comes into play, whether it be a course or a mentor. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a serious lack of apprenticeships and, and mentorships in today's world because everything, like you said, it's available online or um, it's available through these kinds of structured classes where people don't really have a relationship with, with the teacher where they just show up in class and they're a number, you know, in, in university. Um, but I think that for some of these kinds of specialized types of knowledge, that relationship was really important in the past. And where, where the teacher could assess at what point the student is and decide if they're ready to receive the next piece of information, if they're ready to move on to the next step. And initiation process was very important as well, where... Uh, it would mark a transition from one stage to the next. And a student could be initiated multiple times into, you know, the next degree. For example, in the, uh, the Freemasons, they had different levels of initiation that people went through. It's funny the attitude that people have about the Freemasons, though, is a secret society that, um, you know, has evil intentions and withholding information and that sort of thing. And it's actually... Um, it's interesting how our culture observes this kind of thing, the the withholding of information or secret secret info. But then on the other side, I feel like there's such a huge lack of mentorship and actual wisdom. I've been saying this for a long time. And it's not really due to, it's not really the fault of our sort of parents' generation or, or our supposed elders. It's really just the pace of change that we're facing now. Like, we're born into the internet age. They are. They were basically expected to go to school if that's even necessary, and that's the learning period for the rest of their life that they they have to do, and then go to work and you know follow the life script. And we don't have that opportunity anymore. We have to continuously learn forever and ever. So we're expecting to have to constantly get better and to self direct our own learning, and we don't have anyone to basically tell us which direction we should go. So, um, you know, I've really felt a, a huge lack of mentorship as a man, as, you know, someone kind of wanting some sort, sort of initiatory process. There's been nothing for me, mm -hmm. you know, and that's in itself has been kind of a blessing and a curse. It's like we in our generation as millennials, I guess, feel like we can just do whatever we want. We have this this sort of arrogance at the same time as unlimited vision of what is possible out in the world and then we jump to it and, and give it a try and for me that has actually worked quite well because I've been able to you know buy one-way tickets to foreign countries and carry nothing but a backpack and explore and learn and run a business online so it's been actually quite uh, a successful experiment for me but for, I think for most other people it's not it's really difficult it's it's like we have a lot of man childs out there man children you know yeah and actually that reminds me um that mastery becoming a master is also an aspect of the magician putting in the work the the boring grueling hours of studying something and learning it until you finally get it yeah that's true um so we had talked before when we were getting ready for this episode about shamanism and you wanted to incorporate that into this episode. So how, what are your ideas about shamanism? How does that kind of play into the magician archetype? Well, so shamanism was a huge part of our ancestors' life and every village had a shaman or two that were absolutely essential to the life of the village because they would venture out into the unknown um, out into nature, out into the depths of the unconscious mind, and they would risk their own lives in order to come back and bring some sort of knowledge that nobody else could access. And so in the modern world, this kind of thing has been largely lost. And, you know, a, a big part of the, the shaman's life was to actually come back and, and to bring this knowledge back to people. But wasn't it a test of whether they could actually come back at all? Yeah, so that was um, that was considered to be the mark of the shaman. So uh, in in a lot of tribal societies, um, people would sometimes go through this period of several years where they would be in extreme mental anguish and derangement, where they would basically be on the brink of insanity. 
And then if they were able to come back from that, that was considered to be a mark of the shaman. So they were, they were able to go to where most people are not willing or able to go and come back. And often they would bring back some sort of wisdom. They would have a profound connection to nature or they would get some sort of insight or they would figure out, you know, what's plaguing the, the fields or um, the, you know, what kind of diseases people would have. And they would have some sort of an insight about how to fix it. So very few people undertake this kind of thing in the modern age because we are so used to our comforts and we come to expect it. Um, and there's also so much stigma about doing this kind of thing. People are labeled insane or psychotic. They're prescribed or obsessed with drugs and into this like sort of psychedelic lifestyle that's, you know, branded as hippie tree hugging. Yeah. Or even if they're not doing psychedelics, um, they're labeled as insane or prescribed some sort of drugs. Uh, and you know, basically that, that gift that they could bring to the world is lost. And so Jordan Peterson actually has a really good lecture about this where he talks about shamanism in the modern context where um, this is actually a really valuable thing and it shouldn't be confused with mental illness. So what happens when a person dives really deep into the recesses of their mind is that they start questioning all of their assumptions. They start questioning all the structures that are in the mind and they come to realize that all of it is constructed, that it's not actually solid. And so that's what causes this deranged state because all of their assumptions, all of their mental frameworks are collapsing. And so their sense of self might be dissolving, their sense of the world might be dissolving, but then eventually they do come back. Well, most people come back, some maybe, no, not fully. Um, but I've known it, several who haven't. Yeah, it's true. That happens for sure. Um, but those who do come back and are able to communicate it and, and bring some sort of value to the world, um, well, that's really important. Um, especially in times like we are living in now where it's becoming more difficult to make sense of things and where there's so much false information out there and to see through it, it might take something like this kind of shamanic quest to actually strip away all the bullshit and to see what's beneath. It's interesting um, the the kind of description that you gave of people needing to run away and and be in isolation and go through some sort of shamanic experience, uh, whatever that might be through psychedelics or meditation, and how many people we've heard of who've gone through an ayahuasca experience and then come back and then suddenly they're like com completely changing everything in their business and their personal lives and their family lives and everything like that. It's just like one jump. And then all of a sudden they're like a healer and, and uh, a successful entrepreneur and that sort of thing. Like they've taken some sacred knowledge back with them. It's interesting how the shadow version of the magician is almost like the the person who hasn't gone on that shamanic journey, but has somehow received some kind of knowledge whether it just be through hard work of studying or you know they've gone in and learned something very difficult and then their idea of sharing that with the world has become like making a profit and not giving people all of the the insider secrets it's like typical of the internet marketing world or the pickup world mm -hmm. yeah yeah so okay let's let's talk about the shadow versions then and i think this this is very much um similar to how the warrior is perceived so what people think about when they think of the warrior is the shadow version and it's i think it's a little bit similar with the magician people are suspicious of right. of magicians they either idolize them they put them on a pedestal they think they're some sort of a saint um, like Steve Jobs, for example, people really idolized him and, you know, had this like almost religious, uh, fervor about him. Yeah. But then if you read his biography, he was a huge asshole. <laughs> so, so what is the, what is the first shadow of the shadow polarities of the magician? The detached manipulator. So we kind of were getting to that one. Um, it's basically that internet marketer scammer who um uh, 
doesn't give all of the information away. There's a huge part of the magician archetype that is about learning something difficult, then giving it away. And really the shadow version is excluding the second part mm -hmm. or at least not giving full information away or charging a huge amount for it and that sort of thing. So there's there comes with the magician archetype this built-in necessity to elevate other people up to the same level that you're at. Yeah, there can be other flavors of of this um, shadow version as well. There can be uh, the detached, self-important mystic sitting on top of the mountain, um, you know... Judging everyone. Judging everyone and not giving away any of the information. Even if he doesn't have negative intentions, even if he isn't manipulating or extracting money, he's just not making that information available. It's, there's another funny thing where they've convinced themselves that they have found some secret knowledge that they really haven't. And so it's really about shrouding, uh, you know, what they don't know from other people as something that they do know, like pretending they know something that they don't so that other people will follow them or pay them or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, building in mystery to your character. Yeah. Or there can be the really horrible version, which is the cult leaders who may have some secret knowledge, who may really understand how people's minds work, but then they use it to abuse and manipulate people mm -hmm. and break people, basically. Yeah. So it can go really, really dark. I think the shadow version of the magician is probably one of the darkest archetypes. It can go really I don't know about evil. That. We haven't got to the king one yet. And the warrior is just like this sadistic, brutal, you know, kill everything for the sake of killing kind yeah. of thing. So. I this suppose. one's just more mentally manipulative, mm -hmm. I think. It, they'll they'll separate you from your money very quickly. <laughs> or your sanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, the character Voldemort comes to mind. Um, or uh, Sauron from uh, uh, Lord, Lord of, of the, the Rings. Rings. So, yeah, there's some really good examples of the magician. And then there's the, the light magician, like uh, Dumbledore from Harry Potter. Which is all about sharing the yeah, information. Yeah, exactly. His teaching. And, um, or uh, from Lord of the Rings as well. Oh, Gandalf. Gandalf, yeah. Yeah. So protecting people, uh, teaching people, guiding people. That is, yeah, guiding, guiding people is a, a big uh, part of the role of the magician character. The other shadow is the innocent one. Mm -hmm. So what's that one? So the innocent one is is somebody who wants to hold some sort of secret knowledge or special skills, but oh, yeah, aren't... they want the power, status, and glory that comes with the secret skill, but they don't want to put in the effort to actually gain this this skill. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they want the status. Yeah, and they don't want to take the responsibility either. Yeah, because with with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, and so holding any kind of secret knowledge always comes with difficulties. Because you have to consider ethics, you have to consider how it affects other people, you have to consider, you know, uh, if you invent something, what are people going to use your invention for? I think for this, though, most people aren't thinking that far ahead to the responsibility. They're actually more turned off by the amount of work required to gain the knowledge because the knowledge takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and that's really it. They're just people who are not it's almost the same as the um the warrior archetype. It's just the weakling who's not able to put forth the effort required to become the he the hero, the warrior or the magician. It takes a lot of effort to get there. Yeah. So the example that we see in a lot of spiritual circles is people who want to appear spiritual but don't actually want to do the work. So they buy all the, the trinkets, they buy their meditation cushions, they buy all the Buddhas to put in their house and the incense, but they don't actually do a whole lot of meditation. They just want to appear spiritual or they might talk in a really soft voice to appear <laughs> all gentle, but then they've got this, you know, seething... <laughs> unexplored, untamed sexuality that they don't know how to deal with or uh, just rage, you know. Basically, they haven't done the work to deal an with An unexplored, their unconscious mind. Yes, yes. Okay, so some of the ways to access the magician archetype. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Well, learn to meditate. That's a great one yeah. because you have a four billion years of evolution that you're carrying in you and there's a lot of wisdom stored in that. So you have a wealth of knowledge inside of you that is accessible at any time. Yeah. For me, um, it, 
meditation is definitely a great way. Just finding a, a space for silence because I, I know in family life, we don't even have kids and it's hard to find silence just with a, in a two person household. It's hard to find just kind of your own space. And so people who have big families, that's going to be nearly impossible. So it becomes more important to do so, to find your own, like go for a walk in a park and find your kind of sanctuary where you can be alone with your thoughts. Read a lot. That's a big thing. I mean, for me, that's been critical. Trying to get through a book a week has been a goal of mine for a long time. It's probably closer to a book a month, but um, taking courses. I mean, really not being daunted by... Uh, a large amount of learning or something that seems too technical or too difficult to learn. Like for me, I've just been on this kick of automation and I've just learned like how to program uh, scripts and stuff so I can do web scraping and, and like basically have everything launched immediately from my computer so I can like turn on the lights with a key command or turn on the aircon or do a whole bunch of things in the house and a whole bunch of things with the production stuff. And I, before I started doing that, I thought, okay, this, if I get into this, this is going to take a lot of my time. It's going to be really difficult. And only one of those things was true. It was difficult, but it took like a couple of days to really get through it. And then I was like, wow, I know how to script. Like, and that nothing, like anything I've done in the past makes me feel like a magician more than, than learning to script, learning programming. Cause you're like, you, you basically just make shit happen all this magic happens with just a key press. Right. There's a quote that goes, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your your point about making a sacred space. Uh, so our ancestors considered a lot of things sacred. And this wasn't just superstition. They actually experienced things as sacred. And since I started doing a lot of meditation, I had... I started having these experiences as well, where I would experience things as really profound as sacred. And so um, they had a separation from the sacred and the profane. So, you know, daily life was profane, but then certain things or certain situations were sacred. And a lot of the time there was a ritual to signify that it's sacred. Um, and we don't have that in daily life. Everything becomes mundane. And so I think that the modern person is just so starved for things that are sacred so it's really important to make sacred space it's funny though because it seems like they make things sacred that aren't really sacred you know certain things that you just can't talk about anymore like racism um, or culture or negative elements of culture uh, you just can't really talk about that kind of stuff so it's like there there is this artificial creation of sacred spaces that i i think are are happening because there's a lack of actual sacred spaces. Hmm, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, because if you think about the things that our ancestors thought were sacred, it was things like nature, uh, reproduction, food, you know, thing, basically things that sustained life in a really profound way. Those things were sacred. Yeah, and now we treat culture like it's sacred. Yes. So it's actually completely backwards. Yeah. You know, it's funny how before we started traveling, how many people would talk about the upcoming trip as if it's the best thing about it would be the exposure to culture. And I thought about that after we had traveled for a while and how culture is one of the shittiest things about not just about travel, but about the human experience. It's one of the worst things. It's one of the worst things that hold us back in a lot of ways. Unless there's some sort of element of tradition that is is meant uh, where there's a focus on mindfulness. Wisdom traditions, yes. basically. But when it's culture for the sake of, well, perpetuating something because it's old, um, and which is in most cases what culture is, it's just toxic. And it's just in many cases about... Um, I hate to say it, but it's about nationalism and power. Mm -hmm. Like culture gets kind of intertwined with like, this is our country. And it's like, at that point, it's just ignorance. I mean, I hate to I hate to name names and, and pick out countries, but there are some countries we've been to, and I, you know what I'm talking about, where if anything wrong is ever said about 
the person in charge or the country itself or even the fucking color of the flag, uh, you're going to get hit in the head with some sharp object, you know, blunt object. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's this kind of statement that I've heard in many places that this is insert, our country. This is our country. Insert country name here. <laughs> yeah. It's scary and silly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That reminds me. So another role of the magician mm. is is to see beneath these kinds of structures. And this is part Call of... things out too. The, yes. the, the trickster. I love that archetype because it calls shit out, mm -hmm. you know? Calls people on their bullshit. Yeah. Reveals the truth. Yes. Has the courage to speak truthfully and, and call things out. Yes, exactly. And and culture is is not those things. Culture is kind of this consensus reality that everybody agrees on. It's an imagined order so that a large group of people can cooperate. Right. That's why it exists. And... Uh, but culture is not immovable. It has to evolve with the times. It has to evolve as the society evolves. But sometimes it doesn't. And some people try to preserve culture just for the sake of, you know, preserving power or, it's old. or status or just for nostalgia. Yeah. Or they don't even understand why something used to be done and they want to keep keep perpetuating it. Like there are some silly things in the Bible that people just take seriously like not eating shellfish without like they don't analyze why it was written into the bible it was written because these people lived in the desert before they had refrigeration before they had the ability to test food for pathogens and shellfish tended to have salmonella and other kinds of things that it you know it could make, you, make sick. you sick especially in the desert sun when it's 40 degrees and it's been sitting outside for a day so, yeah, of course, in their context, it made sense not to eat shellfish. But in today's context, it doesn't make sense. It reminds me of that saying one of the, uh, my favorite comedians. One of, it's either Carlin or Louis C.K. or Bill Burr. One of them said that um, the difference between a cult and a religion is that in a religion, the leader or the founder is dead. <laughs> so it's, it just relates to the culture thing enough time has passed that the leader is dead and now we view this as a legitimate you know doctrine um if so cult and culture have the same yeah <laughs> the same yeah. root <laughs> yeah so uh one more thing before we end this i wanted to talk about some of the famous uh shamans or magicians in our culture mm -hmm. and uh one of my favorites of all time is uh maynard james keenan from from tool uh, which we're going to see in June in Prague. I'm so, oh, so excited. For that. Um, so Maynard, if you really check out his lyrics, he he mixes, and especially the titles of the songs, he mixes the profane and the profound together all the time. So there's so many songs that are called just absurd names, disgusting names. One one of them is like Hooker with a Penis. What are some other ones? like Stink Fist. Stink Fist. Ugh. But then you read the lyrics, and it's like the most profound lyrics most of the time. Um, there's this one song that I've re recommended to so many people, uh, right into right into that's right. Uh, it's off of their last album, which is like from 2012 or 10 or something. Um, they haven't done any albums for a while. Um, 10,000 days, 10,000 days. Thanks. You know what I'm going to say next? Um, that song is about angels watching, um, humanity evolve over time and start to look at objects and split them, look at land and objects and split them right in two. So the angels say like, why did father give these humans free will? Uh, all they do is divide it mm -hmm. essentially. So go check that out. If you're into metal or that kind of like heavier style music, uh, highly, re highly recommend it if you haven't heard them already. Mm -hmm. And then just check out the lyrics, pull up the lyrics and read through the songs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another song about DMT, a DMT trip where I think he smokes DMT, gets abducted by aliens, and then he he's trying to describe to the doctors that he's the chosen one. <laughs> it's so, so ridiculous. Um, yeah, talk about uh, shamans going to the brink of sanity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maynard is there. And now he's like a successful wine seller. He's in four bands and... You know, he's he's so prolific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
A lot of the inventors in human history were also the shaman or, or magician archetype. And uh, it's interesting because a lot of them actually did go through this period of insanity and isolation and derangement uh, where they were often very isolated from society. And then they came back with some brilliant insight. For example, Carl Jung came up with his theory of the human unconscious and the archetypes after this kind of period of derangement. Uh, Charles Darwin came up with this theory of ev evolution the same way. Nikola Tesla came up with the alternating current in the same way. Nikola Tesla had a, a lifetime, actually, of derangement and isolation, and he didn't have very many human relationships. I think he died a virgin. Um, oh, that's... Yeah, really? And, yeah, and he, I think so. Um, and he had, yeah, he had this very kind of deep, profound, emotional relationship with pigeons <laughs> around him. Oh. He was very isolated. Um, but he came up with, you know, one of the most prolific inventors in human history. So it's interesting how these things uh, tend to go together. Of course, it's not always the case. Some people just go insane and, you know, never produce anything. So, and I think that that is kind of the risk uh, inherent in the shaman archetype. It's an, uh, you either perish or you gain some deep insights. Before we go, I want to tell one short story. There was a guy I grew up with, and I, I can't name names, and I'm sure people who know me from that time period know who exactly who I'm talking about. He was a good friend, um, and he, right into his teenage years, uh, got schizophrenia, and it ran in his family, and suddenly he started behaving really differently. He was actually living at my house. He was renting a room in the house um, during this time. So I, I watched this transition where he was a very sober, very normal guy, just with, he was a bit eclectic, played music. And I thought he was one of the more brilliant writers I've, I'd met in person. And he, he played, you know, guitar and bass and sang and, and I thought he was, he was quite a talented writer. And then over time, the songs just started getting weird. You know, they, they got, uh, harder to understand what he was trying to accomplish. And then he would be singing and practicing and he would start hearing himself in a different way. And I, I would ask him, I'd be like, don't you hear yourself? Like, can you uh, recognize that you're out of key? And he'd be like, no, I'm just, I'm playing the key that I want to play. And so it seemed like everything had intention and everything had a vision and a perspective, but it was just a vision and perspective that nobody could share. And it got worse and worse and then he started talking to himself and then he, he you know he would uh describe events that would that had happened that i was actually there in the room with him uh, uh at the time of the event that he's describing i'm like that totally didn't happen um and it just got worse and worse and eventually we for our own like feeling of safety we had to ask him to leave because it was just getting weird and uh so i I couldn't help but but notice the dedication to his craft, music, and how off into some other world he was going and how he would kind of like be veering off and on of this path of like brilliance and insanity and brilliance and insanity. And unfortunately, he just kind of went off on the path that, you know, didn't really produce anything in this world. And... um it's a really unfortunate, but it was interesting to watch the the kind of change over time from the very beginning. Yeah, I've I've heard this from several people who have done a lot of consciousness exploration. And actually, I think Jordan Peterson also mentions it in his lecture on shamanism, which I'll link to in the show notes of this episode, that um, people who go insane and shamans go to the same place. The only difference is that the shamans know how to come back. That was my kind of my point there. Yeah. And so that's why this this um, kind of giving back to the world or mentoring or teaching is a huge part of the magician archetype, because if you don't have it, then what ends up happening is that it's either insanity or isolation and their gifts being wasted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other famous people that you think would be interesting to talk about as far as the magician archetype goes? Well, Elon Musk is a, uh, a magician archetype for sure. Uh, you know, he's an engineer, inventor, entrepreneur, yeah. which are the 
kind of how the magician archetype tends to manifest in the modern times. Yeah. I want to finish with, with one point that just because somebody holds secret knowledge doesn't mean they should be idolized. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's because that will drive somebody into the shadow side very quickly, or it can. Um, so, you know, people idolize Elon Musk and that might end up being his downfall. I mean, he's held up pretty well so far, but we don't know yeah. what's going to happen. It very well could. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you get in this feedback loop where you're you're only hearing that kind of bubble information from other people who are kind of your your fans um and you start to believe the bullshit uh, and there's no there's no escape from that reality bubble and if the if everyone externally is just telling you you're something eventually you're going to believe it yeah and i think that part of the danger lies in the fact that if you hold some sort of secret knowledge that nobody else holds well, nobody can verify whether you hold it or not. See, I, I have a problem with this, and it relates to a book that I read a few years ago called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which I've, it occurs to me that a lot of people who've read that book have no idea what that book is about. It's about people's fear of technology and their fear of, of learning complex technical things because knowing that information is... Uh, beneficial, um, but complicated enough that they feel like they should have someone else do it to do it properly, or like they're not the kind of person that can learn it. And to me, this is like, I mean, when we talk about what we do on this podcast, when we talk about the future and technology and this kind of stuff, and people ask us about the future and they ask us, well, what do you think about all this technology that, you know, in the world? We, you just did a talk yesterday and pe you've got that question again. It's like, if you don't know what technology is, if you don't know how it works, then clearly you're just going to have this, this built-in fear because you have, it's a mystery. It's what, something you don't understand. It's in this box that is unknowable. And I don't think people realize how easy this stuff is to learn. Like how a bit of effort and a couple of good YouTube searches and you are like, within hours away from understanding a very complex subject and figuring out how this thing works. How does your computer work? How does your phone work? What does it mean that we might have artificial intelligence in the future or nanotech or any of this stuff? What does it actually mean? How could it possibly work? What does it take to make these, these things work? I mean, yeah, maybe it's a bit of time investment and it's hard work, but it's not impossible to learn. And that was the point of that book. Like you can, just put a bit of effort in, learn how to maintain your motorcycle, and then you never have to take it to a mechanic ever again. Mm -hmm. I just love that book. So on that note, um, all of the books, uh, YouTube videos that we've talked about, um, anything else, any resources we're going to be linking to in the description of this video. So you can check that out there. Mm -hmm. um, and as well, if you're listening to this on the podcast, then go check out the show notes because there's we put a lot of effort into that and there's a lot of good information there. Mm -hmm. All right, see you in the next episode. Okay, bye. Bye. This episode is brought to you by Qualia, a nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and mood. To get 10% off, use the code FUTURE at checkout. And to learn more about neurohacking, visit futurethinkers.org slash neuro. Thanks for tuning in to Future Thinkers. For all the books, resources, and mentions from this episode, go to futurethinkers.org slash 75. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new videos. You can also follow us on social media to stay connected. If you'd like to get a t-shirt like the new Make America Think Again, go to futurethinkers.org slash store. If you like what we do and you want to help us make more podcasts and videos, consider donating or becoming a patron at futurethinkers.org slash support. Also visit our sponsor Qualia and use the coupon code FUTURE to get 10% off your purchase.